Okay, great. Okay, well, welcome to lecture three on double copy. Um, so in this lecture, I'm going to start connecting the double copy to topics in classical physics. So the the sort of the idea here is, you know, the double copy is obviously a fantastic thing. It's a real insight into how you know, so the structure, the perturbative structure of scattering amplitudes in gravity. Um, they're much simpler than you would expect if you were to look at the einstein hilbert lagrangian yeah, obviously. The einstein hilbert lagrangian is notorious for having a very complicated perturbation theory. But that's also a problem in another domain, in classical physics, for example, in the theory of um, gravitational wave physics. So in that theory, we study the details of the gravitational wave dynamics in perturbation theory. So again, you face this issue that perturbation theory in Einstein gravity, even classically, is very, very complicated. So um, it's fantastic from that perspective that the double copy has implications going beyond scattering amplitudes. So I mean, the double copy really wants to compute whatever observable uh, you're interested in. Um, so once you can connect these observables to scattering amplitudes, you can use the double copy to um, figure out what the expressions are. So uh, the lecture uh, well, today and um, my next lecture are gonna uh, just uh, sort of uh, touch, on, touch on these points. So the key uh, message uh, of well, this lecture is basically that uh, perturbative gravity, you know, quantum and classical, I'll put it in red as it's an important message, is much simpler than you might expect. Uh, so certainly much simpler than you'd expect if you were looking at uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Feynman rules that follow from uh, the, the einstein hilbert lagrangian Okay, now, um, what I'll do first of all is explain how to compute quantities in, in classical physics using uh, scattering amplitudes, and then we'll be able to use the, the, per, the power of the double copy. So once we express amp observables in terms of amplitudes, the double copy is available to us. So we need um, you know, some method of connecting amplitudes to um, classical physics. And now I'm gonna do a couple of different examples that always have the same structure. So the basic idea is, um, so basic idea, yeah, um, for connecting, um, double copy, uh, try to spell the basic idea to connect for connecting the double copy to classical physics is so the first thing you do, or at least the basic idea I use, um, is to pick an observable which makes sense both classically and quantum mechanically. So I will give you a couple of examples. both classically and quantum mechanically. So I want to have an observable that I can talk about in both theories uh, sensibly. So an example of an observable that would be bad, which I'm not going to talk about, for example, the number of gravitons radiated in some event. That would be bad because it doesn't make sense classically. Right? So I don't want to talk about that. Um, we then arrange an initial quantum state that's in the domain of validity of the classical theory. So I'm going to use the a quantum mechanical formalism because I want to talk about amplitudes of the double copy. So I have to use a quantum language. So I pick some quantum state, but I just arrange so that it happens to be in the domain of validity of the classical approximation to the quantum theory. Uh, so it's in the domain of validity. Uh, 
Remember this classical physics is always just an approximation to the quantum theory. So we just have to be in the correspondence region and things are gonna work out for us. So, and then once you've done that, you just, uh, you try to organize the computation using amplitudes. So, okay, so good. Now that's the basic idea. Oh, let me give you an example of it working in, I think is the simplest case. Uh, the simplest thing to talk about is the impulse. So the impulse is, well, classically, uh, simply the total change in momentum during some uh, event. So delta P mu is the change in momentum and you just perform a time integral of uh, dP mu d tau. So for example, you know, I'm gonna talk about, the simplest thing I'm gonna talk about is charge scattering you know, in, in plane um, electricity and magnetism. So you take two charges, scatter them. Um, you could even take one to be very heavy and just scatter one off the other one, you know, light one bouncing off a heavy one. Uh, so in that circumstance, the impulse uh, is obtained by integrating the Lorentz force uh, over all times. Uh, so it's just the total change of momentum. Okay, um, now quantum mechanically, uh, this still makes sense. So what you can do is compute the expectation value of the momentum operator. You can measure the expectation value of the momentum operator. So you have some experiments, repeat it many times uh, and measure the expectation value of uh, the change in momentum of some particle in a scattering event. So this is the plan. I compute the expectation value of the momentum operator. And I'm going to call that momentum operator big P. So I'll try to give a sort of blackboard bold look. Um, so we can compute this expectation value in uh, the far past. And in the far future, far future, and simply subtract. So delta p mu then in quantum mechanics, I'll just use the same. You know, they're supposed to be equal, so I'm just going to use the same uh, notation. Um, so now the state in the far future, I'll call it psi out. So that will be uh, the momentum in the far future is this term, so momentum on the out state. Uh, and you just subtract the momentum on the in-state. The expectation value of the momentum on the in-state. So, uh, so this is a quantum expression for, for this observable. So it's an observable, it makes sense in both the uh, classical and the quantum mechanical theories. Okay, now, um, how can we connect this to amplitudes? Well, the out-state uh, the outstate is obtained by the time evolution operator uh, acting on the instate. But the time evolution operator from the very far past to the very far future is nothing but the S matrix. So you know, I'm just going to call uh, the instate psi from now on. Uh, so uh, the S matrix comes in this way. And of course, um, you know, that's good for us because uh, the S matrix is connected to the amplitudes. So I can write this delta P mu as, uh, well, inserting for psi out, uh, S times psi in. So there's an S dagger, P mu S, psi minus psi. Uh, let's give myself a little bit of space here. I'm going to put something in there. Uh, expectation value of P mu and psi. So this is just uh, rewriting this. Okay, so uh, now to get a nicer expression, uh, it's handy to insert S dagger S in here. So that's just one, a unitarity of the S matrix, S dagger S is one. But now you see uh, you know, the two terms here you know, uh, just differ by the order in which 
uh, the S matrix appears with the P. Right? So there's a commutator because of the minus sign. We get a commutator of S and P. Now writing S, S matrix in terms of the transition matrix T, matrix elements of T are amplitudes. Um, well, the one term is going to go away. So in that commutator, uh, the one term would go away because you know, one commutes with P mu. Uh, in the S dagger, that's uh, an overall factor. Uh, well, that will still be there. So we're going to get two terms. Um, and the expression for the impulse looks like uh, the following. So this is the term from the one in this S dagger. Uh, commutator of P mu with uh, T psi, and then the other term is just uh, looking at this it, uh, psi t dagger uh, times p mu t psi. Okay, so that's the, the formula, master formula, if you want, for computing this, um, for computing this impulse, this observable. Now, here we've got T, matrix elements of T are amplitudes. So this delta P is inevitably going to come out in terms of scattering amplitudes. In this second term here, I've got T dagger, well, that's an amplitude complex conjugate, times uh, some amplitude. You know, there's obviously some stuff, you know, the P will give us some stuff, some momenta, no big deal. There'll be some momenta floating around the place. But uh, in this term, I'm going to get an amplitude star times an amplitude, which you can also think of as a cut of a loop amplitude. So um, and maybe this is one thing to emphasize. Um, we'll get loop amplitudes, right? You now you expand this thing out here. Yeah, sometimes um, there's an old lore that tree amplitudes are classical and loop amplitudes are quantum. That lore is not accurate. Uh, you need to be more specific about what amplitudes you mean. But amplitudes in general, uh, loop amplitudes in general, uh, can have classical contributions. Um, and this formula is one way in which you can see that. So we get loop amplitudes here, here we get cut loop amplitudes. Uh, at lowest order, we'll just get a tree amplitude. So the lowest order term will be here. Uh, uh, amplitudes have perturbative fact factors, so if you just got two of them, that will be higher order. So this is the lowest order term. Okay, now, uh, well, that was very, you know, very straightforward. And, you know, we didn't use anything about P, right? You just, it was just going along for the ride. So more generally, uh, and, and we will see some more examples, uh, you could consider the change in some operator O. Let's say, say operator O, I'm no good at calligraphic O, so I'll just make it look a bit fancy. Um, so just replacing, uh, the P mu for an arbitrary operator O, the thing is going to work out like this. So we can compute a whole slew of uh, observables this way, which has got some operator in it goes. Okay, well now um, a critical part of this, of course, is we want to connect to classical physics. So we need to set up the state. I haven't said anything about the state psi so far, it's just been there. But we need the state psi to be in the domain of the classical approximation to the quantum theory. So let me spend a while discussing the state. Um, okay, so now I'm going to restrict to situations where you have two massive particles in the far past that I'm going to scatter. Uh, it is possible to do more general things like uh, shoot radiation in and scatter a particle off it, but in these lectures I'm just going to stick to uh, scattering of two massive particles. So they should be, uh, you know, well separated in the far past. And um, so I'm going to come in and interact and then go out. So it's just a simple scattering experiment. Uh, the particle in the gauge theory, I'm going to switch on a charge, obviously, otherwise something would happen. We want to do double copy, so the gauge theory would be some sort of a Yang Mills theory.
Okay, now, um, now in the classical world, and uh, these particles would have um, exact positions and momentum. Of course, we can't have that in the quantum world. That's just not, not allowed. Um, uncertainty principle, etc. not gonna work. But what we can do is arrange a situation in which the uncertainty in the positions of the momentum is negligible. Right. That's, well, that's as good as we can do. Of course, that's how, that's how the classical world emerges from classical. Yeah. That's how the classical world emerges from quantum physics. Quantum stuff is negligible. Okay, so we replace exact with negligible. That's the, the basic idea. Okay, now, um, um, very good. So, if I'm gonna have small uncertainty in both position and momentum, then I must inevitably put my particles into wave packets. So I'll introduce some wave packets. Now the details of the wave packets are gonna go away in the end. You have to have them in intermediate stages. So the picture uh, so in a quantum world is I'll have two particles. You know, I will introduce a, a symbol for the spread of the wave packet. So this is a position space picture. And that's, uh, I'll say that the wave packets have spread LW. Now, I've written both LW for both, the spread of both particles, but you know, just of order LW, they don't have to be ex exactly equal. The distance between them, uh, between these particles should be of order the impact parameter B. So, uh, you know, the classical picture here is I'm shooting two particles, you know, they're separated in the far past, but I shoot them at one another. And the impact parameter is the distance between them, uh, this perpendicular distance between them. Okay, um, very good. So the spread, the wave functions have some spread. Uh, so is this LW uh, in position space? So then if you want to know what the spread of the wave packet is in momentum space, you do a Fourier transform. So and you'll find that the, the spread in momentum space is one over LW. So by the way, I'm, I'm working in H bar equals one unit. So like we usually do particles. particles. Good. Now, um, well, as this picture indicates, I better have this quantum mechanical um, spread of the wave packet very small compared to B. So throughout the uh, situation, you better have LW very much less than B. It can be useful to think about these, um, you know, the, these inequalities in, in dimensionless terms. So this is just LW over B is, is very small. Now that's not the only thing we need. Right? We also need that the uncertainty in the momentum of the particles better be very small compared to another classical scale. I care about the mass of the particles. I mean, it's a momentum spray spread, very large compared to the mass. Clearly, that wouldn't work classically. So, uh, so we certainly need uh, this inequality. Now, the mass of m, I can also trade it for the Compton wavelength of the particle. So, we want to write things in terms of um, in terms of lengths. M is you know, up to some well, a h bar and some maybe some factors, uh, depending on your definition of Compton wavelength. Um, um, it's just one over LC. So in other words, that means that uh, LC is very, very small compared to the wave packet spread. So uh, putting it together, we have uh, a series of inequalities uh, like this. Now, um, so that's good for our initial setup, right? But uh, as the particles move around the place, uh, I will always need their separations to be small compared to the, um, their, their separation to be large compared to the size of the wave packets. So the particles will always be quite far apart. You know, the wave packets are super tiny. Um, the physics doesn't see it. So what that means is that throughout 
more generally. Uh, we need uh, so we need that the modes of the field that's mediating the interaction. We need these modes. So the field could be, you know, now maybe it's photons, gravitons, gluons, uh, but we need the momenta of all of these particles to be such that the wavelength, you know, the, the wavelength corresponding to that momentum uh, has to be large compared to the spread of the wave pattern, right? So it's under circumstances like that, that uh, the gluons, gravitons, et cetera, won't be able to see the wave packet. You know, the wave packet size is very small compared to the wavelength of the mediating um, force carriers. So, oops. Oops. So we need the wavelength uh, of uh, the force carriers. Be handy to have a word for force carriers, so I will call force carriers. I may call force carriers messengers. So these messengers are the gravitons, the gluons, the photons, whatever is mediating the interaction between our massive particles. Yeah, you know, basically the stuff that makes up the field classically. The wavelength of these messengers to be large. So, um, so if these messengers have, uh, let's say they have momentum, well, I'll typically use a Q to donate to denote the uh, momentum of uh, one of my force carriers. So the wavelength is of order one over Q. Uh, so then this uh, set of inequalities will really be uh, one over Q here. That's the, the wavelength. Uh, and one over Q expected to be of order B for gentle scattering. So that's the, the situation I'm working into. Okay, now it can be um, useful to think about this uh, in terms of effective field theory, if you want. So um, the point about the effective field theory is that there's, uh, there's a cutoff scale. The cutoff scale is the mass M. And so uh, that just cuts off our effective theory. I will just consider scattering uh, with momenta very small compared to M. So the messenger momentum would be very small compared to M. And um, the interesting thing about it is that there is another scale. So there is the cutoff scale M, but there's another scale, which is the scale LW. LW, if you want to think about it, is, is a finite size of the particle. So um, you know, the, this cutoff uh, gets rid of uh, quantum effects, including pair production. Right? So if the momenta is small, Compared to the mass, I can't pair produce any of these massive particles. So no pair production. That's a quantum phenomenon. Uh, but in addition to this uh, cutoff scale, there's a there's this finite size scale LW, and I'm working in the region where that finite size scale is small. So that's the point particle approximation, classical and point particle, classical point particle. Okay. Um, well, let me make a couple of comments. Um, so as I said, I'm neglecting uh, all finite size corrections. Um, and that's uh, partially just uh, you know for the sake of lectures, you can include them if you want. You certainly can include them. Um, uh, there are many interesting things to be said about finite size corrections. Spin, for example, can be considered as a finite size correction. There are other ones that are interesting and important and have been considered. Um, okay, so in uh, if I apply this to plain old electromagnetism, you know, QED, um, scatter two charges, I will get Coulomb scattering. Right. Classically, that's how that's how you recover this quantum mechanically. Why don't you just, just expand out these expressions? And that's all we will do. In, in general relativity, yeah. So if I take two particles in uh, two massive point-like particles in general relativity and scatter them, well, the scattering is mediated by the metric that is built up by by these objects. And, objects as they move will have some metric as they interact that metric will be some complicated thing right? uh, it won't just be Schwarzschild right 
uh, static, you know, if I just one heavy particle, another light one scattering off it, uh, well, that would be scattering in Schwarzschild, but you've got two particles interacting, both massive, then the metric you build up is an interaction metric, more general than Schwarzschild. So Schwarzschild plus corrections. Um, Uh, by the uh, by, these interacting bodies, interacting objects. So the Schwarzschild metric at lowest order, uh, plus higher order, there will be corrections. So, for example, you know these things come together and interact; um, they will generate gravitational radiation. So, um, so the gravitational radiation will be taken into account by all this stuff. And um, I'm Neglecting finite size corrections in GR. So um, finite size corrections neglected. So that means that the Schwarzschild radius better be small. So the Schwarzschild radius be small compared to B. So I have small, you know small black holes uh, separated by a large distance uh, scattering. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the setup. Now, um, let me give you a little bit of notation. So well, maybe when I say, let me give you, it's really to give me some notation so I don't have to keep writing the same things over and over again. Um, but the state, motivate why I want to do this. The state is, so some state psi, there's some integral, right? I've got wave packets to do some integral. So I'm going to work in momentum space, you know, because I'm a choosy guy. I like momentum space. I've got to integrate over the momentum of the particles in some way. I have to put my wave packets together. So a wave packet for particle one, a wave packet for particle two. I'll translate one particle with respect to the other by the impact parameter B. Well, that's my impact parameter coming in. Uh, and then I have uh, single particle states for my, for my particles. Okay, now uh, this integral here is over Lorentz invariant phase space of both bodies. So, um, so I will define uh, a notation for the Lorentz invariant phase space. I'm going to define d phi of p1 and p2 to be equal to uh, d3 p1 over 2 pi cubed 2e uh, particle 1, d3 p2, 2 pi cubed 2e particle 2. These are the Lorentz invariant phase space measures in my conventions. Um, now, uh, even though that, that's yeah, a lot of writing. Um, I'm further going to introduce uh, just a shorthand notation for uh, d's. So let me write uh, d hat p, it's just a normalized dp. Sometimes people write this as d bar p, uh, but we're, uh, I'm just going to put hats for normalization. Uh, and a delta hat of p, I'm going to call it 2 pi delta p. And you should just tidy up the 2 pi's, right? Uh, two pi's will be hidden away in our notation. Now, so then I can write this uh, measure here, uh, d phi, as uh, d4 p1 with a hat. That's um, delta hat p1 squared minus m1 squared theta of p1 zero. Right? So uh, if you integrate over the, the time component in this momentum, uh, you'll get the 2e factor but there's two solutions to that delta function. So this just picks the positive energy here, positive energy solution uh, times uh, just the same thing for particle two. So the thing to remember here is these, you know, the important things are gonna be these delta functions. We will need them later on, they're important. Um, and I'm also going to set uh, the wave packet product of the wave packets, uh, I'll define it to be just one phi. Right. So this is a two particle wave packet. Okay. Good. 
So now let's um, let's go ahead and actually use this stuff to do a computation. So what I'll work at is the impulse at lowest order in perturbation theory. So, and uh, you know, we'll see how uh, you can use the double copy to actually compute, uh, compute classical impulses. Okay, so um, now the formula for the impulse that I had uh, back up here, uh, yeah, this formula I will just use. Now I'm gonna just grab this term here, uh, copy. I'm grabbing just this term because the second term here is higher order in perturbation theory. So I'm just gonna focus on this one. I'm working at lowest order. So then we we'll have delta P1 mu. Um, notice now I'm talking about delta P1, that is the impulse for one of the particles, particle one. I should put in then the quantum, the momentum operator for the quantum field of particle one. Um, very good. So higher order terms that we'll neglect. Okay, so, well, let's write it out and see how it works. Now, armed with our notation and this uh, expectation value, uh, it's not so hard to write it out. I'm going to get an integral over the, the phase space for uh, particles on this side and an integral over the phase space for the particles, uh, the conjugate particles on the other side. So, integral over phase space from particle one, particle two, I'm also, going to allow myself to put in, uh, you know, two more phase space measures here. So that's just is uh, uh, a product of two more phase space integrals. So phi star P1 prime, P2 prime. So that's the wave packet from uh, this side, right? Phi of P1 and P2 for the wave packet coming from here. We also have these translation operators, e to the i b dot P1 minus P1 prime. Those are the two translation operators times um, P1 prime, P2 prime. That's the states, the two particle states that are in there uh, are operators uh, and the states that were on the other side of these guys coming from there. Okay, so that's what the impulse is. Now, um, the guts, you know, the important part, the dynamics of the calculation are all in here, right? So the details of the dynamics are in this transition operator. So let me uh, now just focus on, on that important bit, simplify it out a little bit. So it simplifies quite quickly. Um, so this P operator here, you know, well, there's one term in the commutator where it's to the left, then it gives me the momentum of, uh, the state on the left, the other term in the commutator, it gives me the momentum of the, the state in the ket on the right, um, times P1 prime, P2 prime, T. And uh, now when we see Ts, you know, at least if you're a scattering average the person, feel quite delighted because matrix elements of T are the amplitudes, P1 prime mu minus P1 mu, Scattering amplitude from P1, P2 to P1 prime, P2 prime times a momentum conserving delta function. And I put the hat there because there's a two pi to the four. So uh, the impulse uh, at lowest order is coming out in terms of a four point amplitude at lowest order. So we can draw a picture for our amplitude. Here it is. So I'll take particle coming in, momentum P1. These are our two incoming particles uh, going out with uh, momentum P1 prime and P2 prime. But I'll introduce a bit of notation for that. So I'm going to call the outgoing guy P1 plus Q, and this one P2 minus Q. So, the, uh, so there's a momentum Q being exchanged uh, in the scattering amplitude. So our messengers are carrying this momentum Q. Uh, from this side to this side. Good. Now, as I said, uh, at lowest order, this will be a three four-point amplitude. 
But at higher order, well, this term is there at higher order, so it's just a, an additional term. So at higher orders, uh, uh, so for example, at next to leading order, you'd encounter uh, a one loop amplitude. So this term here, you know, this amplitude here, uh, would be a one loop amplitude. Uh, from this additional term here, you'd get a tree times a tree, uh, t dagger t. Uh, but that t dagger t is the cut of a one loop amplitude. So at next to leading order, this thing works out as a one loop amplitude minus its cut. Um, so the t dagger t cut So again, um, you know, potentially surprising, but it is just true that uh, in the, uh, that the loops compute classical phenomena. So the nonlinearities in the classical theory have to be somewhere. Um, classical physics is nonlinear. So the classical nonlinearities in this approach are in these loops. Uh, now you might hear people talking about um, people call the post Minkowskian. Post-Minkowskian perturbation theory. So this is this expansion uh, thought of classically. So it's just a perturbative uh, expansion, a classical, uh, a perturbative approach to the classical interacting dynamics. Um, this is especially used in general relativity. The idea being, you know, Minkowski space is just flat, and when you start including Einstein gravity, you go beyond Minkowski. So it's post-Minkowski. And I dislike this uh, language myself, so I'm not going to use it, but um, uh, just thought I'd mention it in case uh, it helps folk understand some uh, stuff you see in the literature. Right there. Okay, well, very good. So where have we got to? And we have seen that these observables, this impulse uh, is, relating, is related to a scattering amplitude. Uh, that means I can use the double cap. I can compute the impulse in gravity because it involves an amplitude. I compute the amplitude using the double copy. And there will be a relation then induced by the double copy between scattering and gauge theory, classical gauge theory, and scattering of gravity. Um, now, at the moment, um, things look a little bit not so great because. If this formula, you know, okay, you know, fine, it's got an amplitude, the amplitude but a double copy, you know, great, when these lectures are in the double copy, it works. But we have these wave packets here. And so what I wanna do is spend a little time simplifying this uh, expression and we'll see what becomes of the wave packets. They're going to go away. So let's see how that works. Um, now, first of all, let me do just some uh, reorganization, if you want, or just uh, just organize the integrals here. So I have several integrals, um, but I also have some delta functions here. So I'm going to do some of the integrals using these delta functions. Um, and I want to organize my computation in terms of this picture with uh, outgoing momentum p1 plus q uh, and p2 minus q. So so well, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'll use uh, I'll use this delta function here, this delta four, to perform the p two prime integral. Right. So uh, so then the p two will be gone. Now the d phi of p two prime. Remember that has a delta function in it, like a, a, just a, a single delta function. So I get rid of four delta functions, but um, I have to remember there was a delta function, a single delta function running around in that P2 prime integral. So there'd be some stuff to pick up. Um, at the second step, I'm going to relabel, just perform a change of variable. So I'm just tidying up these P primes. So I'll do a change of variable from P prime one to P one plus Q. Right, so that's introducing this notation here. So uh, then, uh, well then, because of this delta function, uh, what was the p2 prime before is now going to become um, uh, p2 minus q. I can tidy up like that. Okay. Now, uh, when I change the variable here, uh, I'm not gonna use this d phi notation anymore. Uh, instead, I'll again pick up that delta function. So we pick up two, 
uh, delta functions, a delta uh, of p1 prime squared minus m1 squared, these are delta halves, uh, a delta p2 prime squared minus m2 squared. And there are also these theta functions that are there, a little bit pesky. They're going to go away very soon. Uh, so that's the, here I'm just putting in that was theta of p1 prime 0, uh, theta of p2 prime 0, would be that. So now this p1 squared is p1 plus q squared. Uh, so p1 prime squared will be, uh, p1 squared is m squared, so we'll cancel that. Uh, but uh, the other terms from squaring at p prime, the other terms I'm going to get will be a 2p1 dot q uh, plus q squared. Uh, and here uh, delta 2p2 dot q minus q squared times these theta functions. Uh, I don't know why I have primes there. Got rid of the prime. Sorry. Okay. Um, so the impulse will be uh, start uh, trying to tidy this up. So uh, from well, I've got this factor i. I'm still going to have integral d five p one and p two. So I'll keep that. Um, I'm going to have this integral uh, that's left over from this will be an integral d hat four q. Um, I'm going to get uh, all of all of this stuff here, uh, which I seem to have written out rather big. Let me try and compress it. So these theta functions, uh, that other theta function. Okay, very good. Um, now, uh, back up in our formula for the impulse, we also had uh, wave packets, uh, this e to the i b. Now, p1 prime is p1 plus q, so this will be e to the minus i b dot q, uh, and then we're going to get some amplitude stuff. So phi star uh, p1 prime, p1 plus q, p2 minus q, phi p1, p2, e to the minus i b dot q, from uh, here, we pick up a q mu uh, and the amplitude. So the delta function we've dealt with. So there's just a q mu uh, and the amplitude. I'll just call the amplitude A. OK, so well, maybe this doesn't look like tremendous progress yet, but now we can make use of um, simplifications coming from the classical physics, you know, from the, uh, the fact that I'm working or I'm only interested in the classical approximation. So, and the key simplification is going to be simplification, put in the right number of Fs. So the key thing is going to be from um, these inequalities. Um, so um, now let's look at these wave packets. So in particular, what we can see is that Q is very much less than one over LW. And these wave packets, you know, for particle one and particle two uh, have a width in momentum space, which is one over LW. Right? I usually think of these wave functions as being quite sharply peaked. But the point here is that this Q, this shift in the wave packets here is very small compared to that width. So I can neglect it. So this is just a very small shift um, uh, and therefore uh, very small on the scale of the wave packet. So we can just replace this thing by phi of p1 and p2 phi star. So for this reason, I'm getting phi star phi, right? Uh, an expectation value just over the, uh, these wave packets. Um, similarly here, these theta functions, the, the Qs are very small shifts compared to um, uh, the mass, right? Uh, Q is very small compared to the mass. Uh, so that's because LC is one over M. Q is very small compared to M. So the theta functions will be one right? because uh, the initial things, the initial theta, the initial P20 is definitely uh, positive. Uh, and these shifts here are super small shifts 
uh, compared to something that's big and positive. Um, good. So the impulse then is I. Um, now let me organize this. So we've got our integral measure. Um, we've got this integral d hat for q. Um, e to the minus i b dot q, q mu amplitude uh, times, and I just want to separate this because they sort of play a bit of a different role, so the delta function uh, plus q squared, delta function to p uh, two dot q minus q squared times phi of p1 and p2 squared. Okay. Now, what we have here are sharply peaked functions on the second line. So this thing is a sharply peaked function, uh, the wave packets. Uh, so thinking of them uh, now in terms of you know, what's left here, these are very sharply peaked. So and I'm going to say they're sharply peaked up Classical momentum P is M1U and P2 is M2U2. So these U's would be uh, proper velocities in classical physics. Uh, now, of course, these delta functions are also sharply peaked. You know, uh, in fact, uh, you, know, you know, peaked with zero width. Uh, but, uh, Let's just think about them as being uh, very sharply peaked. Spell. Uh, and what these things, what these delta functions are trying to do, you know, considering that uh, these uh, momenta are approximately m1u, so this one here, for example, is setting uh, two m1u1 dot q. Uh, which you would think of as being something of order one over LW, um, you know, at, at biggest, um, you know, the biggest Q could possibly be is of order one over LW, but it's actually one order in LW suppressed because of the delta function. So this is trying to set it to be uh, order one over LW squared. That's negligible, it's just zero. Right? And the same for The same for uh, from this delta function. So these q squared shifts here, you know, um, they're just uh, they're small shifts again. Uh, we're making you know these delta functions are trying to make these these quantities small. So in this integral, uh, what we have is a convolution of a, a sharply peaked function times delta functions. The final result will be a sharply peaked function not of zero width. But you know, width of order the the width of this of the just width LW of the wave packets, uh, satisfying these conditions. So we write this delta p uh, as the following. So I'm going to introduce uh, double angle brackets uh, and just write the integral like this. Um, so we we'll have delta functions that are enforcing these conditions. Uh, u1 dot q put the two M1 downstairs over two M2, that is a Q, times uh, e to the minus i b dot Q, Q mu uh, times the amplitude. Now the notation here, so these, uh, these angle brackets, um, what they're supposed to do is to tell you that uh, these delta functions here uh, are to be treated with caution, right? So these delta functions are just uh, coming from, uh, that's also not what I meant to do. These delta functions are coming from these requirements here. So they're not strictly delta functions. They're functions of a finite width, but the width is negligible in the classical approximation. So what you're supposed to do with these uh, angle brackets is compute, uh, compute, you know, a formula like this, extract, you know, the amplitude, you know, at loop level, there can be more terms. You have to combine them all together. You know, enforce the correct on-shell constraints, which are these on-shell constraints. These are delta functions, on-shell delta functions. Um, and now once you have assembled uh, the whole expression, there can be some cancellations that you need to uh, track through. Uh, 
then you can uh, simplify these delta functions down to these ones here. That's the role of these, um, these double angle brackets. Um, and we also mean by these double angle brackets that uh, you should uh, impose the, you know, uh, replace the P1s by M1U1 uh, and the P2 by M2U2. Okay. Well, let me write something about that. So you simplify the dot dot dot, whatever is in here, uh, to extract uh, classical parts. So throw away any quantum stuff, you know, take care of any cancellations that look a bit weird. So this part is really relevant to loops. Um, and set the PIs to be mass times U uh, and use uh, UI dot Q equals zero. Okay, so let's do some examples before we finish the lecture. So um, I'm going to use um, information from the last lecture. Last lecture, we uh, had a uh, four point amplitude in a uh, massive gauge theory. And we found it had this form for P1 dot P2 over Q squared. Uh, and there was a double copy four point amplitude in gravity, um, which looks like this. And this is the expression from before. Minus m1 squared, m2 squared over q squared. Now it's nearly the expression from before, is a better way of putting it. There's a minus sign there, which we didn't have in the last lecture. So and that is because, uh, well, the last lecture I chose a phase convention that made the double copy really nice. Uh, but in this lecture, I've been choosing amplitudes uh, as matrix elements of T. Uh, and that picks a, another phase convention. So if you want to uh, use this con phase convention, then you better get, uh, you have to take care of those details. There's a sign that appears. Uh, so that's the origin of that sign. Anyway. Okay, so let's do uh, the first example. Uh, and to make our lives as simple as possible, I'm gonna just uh, do classical E and M. And then the four point amplitude is just E squared. So these t's just become charges uh, for p1 dot p2 over q squared. So uh, now I'm going to put this this expression here uh, into this formula. We encounter a certain integral to do. Yeah. So the, these angle bracket things are not really a big deal here. I don't have to worry about any um, any particular simplifications. It's just a one term amplitude, and um, so all we need to do is uh, perform this integral. So the integral we encounter is uh, I integral d4q uh, delta u1 dot q delta u2 dot q e to the minus ib dot q uh, q mu and one over q squared. We need to worry a little bit about this integral. Um, okay, well, it's it's you know, maybe potentially uh, something to do as an exercise. It is basically, um, well, you can write it as a derivative. So this uh, Q could be brought down as a derivative with respect to B. You know, it's a B derivative. If you work, uh, you know, integrate over those delta functions, you can bring this down to an integral of over two Qs of a one over Q squared. So it's a two dimensional Green's function differentiated. Uh, so it's pretty doable um, with that. Uh, too much struggle. Uh, the only thing is to get the factors right. So, and this is the answer, b mu over b squared. So here I'm defining gamma to be u1 dot u2. So in the, if I pick one of the particles, say u1 to be um, static, then uh, this is just the standard gamma factor you encounter in special relativity. You know, this, is the, the, this is the time component of the velocity of the other guy, that's gamma. 
Okay, um, well then, uh, the impulse is, well, it's just that uh, this integral um, times what's left over in the amplitude here. So uh, impulse is gonna be less than e squared q1 q2 over two pi. Uh, there's a four m1 m2 downstairs, um, but there's also a four m1 m2 upstairs when I replace p1 and p2 by mass times velocity. So those cancel, uh, I can forget about them. What remains in u1.u2 is a gamma. So we've got a gamma over root gamma squared minus one in u over b squared. Okay, so and you could uh, recover that result from integrating the Lorentz force law um, at leading order in Coulomb scattering. Second example, uh, obviously should be in the double copy, so in G or. So, well then we have this amplitude to worry about. Copy it. Um, now I wanna simplify this a little bit. Uh, so kappa squared, well kappa squared is 32 pi G. Uh, I have two downstairs because there's one, two, two twos there. Uh, and then this one here, uh, again over Q squared. So now when I replace PI by mass times velocity, I'm gonna get a factor of M1 squared, M2 squared upstairs here. Uh, there's also the factor of M1, M2 downstairs. So I'll have an overall factor of M1, M2 upstairs. The um, delta p mu then will be, uh, ah, yeah. So now that minus cancels the minus we get here in our integral. Um, uh, there's a two pi downstairs. Here I have a 16 pi upstairs. So that looks like I'm left with an eight, eight G. Um, good. So, well, on the other hand, there's a four downstairs here or M1, M2, we'll leave a four. So if I divide that four out, I'll have a two G. Two G, um, good. So from uh, these factors here, there'll be a two gamma squared from here, minus one uh, over the square root downstairs. Uh, there's one M1, M2 left over because of the M1, M2 downstairs, but uh, two M1, M2s upstairs. Uh, B mu over B squared, and I think that should be it. Yeah. Uh, except possibly I canceled a pi that I shouldn't have. And there's a pi here. Uh, oh, no, maybe not. Yeah, okay, I don't think there's a pi. Potentially wrong in my notes. Okay, so uh, that's the impulse in gravity. One thing to notice, um, well, this is you know, I'm belaboring a bit, maybe the phase convention, it's a plus. Um, this B squared here is negative. Uh, you know, my metric convention is plus minus minus. So B squared is less than zero, it's a spatial distance. Uh, uh, the B points from um, uh, particle, uh, this is not displaced particle one with respect to particle two. So uh, it should be that uh, this uh, impulse is such that the uh, particle one is bent towards particle two. So in the negative B direction. You gotta get your sign right. Gravity is attractive. Okay, that's it for uh, lecture three. Thanks. <laughs>